what I want us to talk about is how do you take a moment and turn it into movement in your life? Because you can't live by moments. You just can't live by having a, a great moment at 180 weekend and then, and then maybe have a great moment at camp and then maybe have a great moment somewhere else down the road. But there are these long periods in between where like you're like, I don't know what direction I'm going. I don't know what to do. And I'm, I'm just kind of wandering. So this morning, I want to talk to you directly about how do we take a moment and turn it into movement in my life. And adults... Uh, some of you in this room are like, okay, great. He's going to talk to the students about that, but come on. You know that in your life, you've had great moments with the Lord. There have been these times when you felt like God moved powerfully in your life, but it was unsustainable. And so I really believe this message has something to say to you as well. It was really interesting um, that I was reading a, a story not too long ago about Amanda Ellers. Amanda Ellers was in Hawaii. She's on the island of Maui. And the island of Maui, the eastern, nearly half of the island, about a little over 40%, is a huge, huge jungle. Part of it's a national park. Part of it is like a forest preserve. Uh, there are different areas that you can go into. But uh, while there are boundaries to these areas, the jungle knows no boundary. It's just like this one huge boundary about the size of four Texas counties. And so Amanda Ellers is going to go on a hike. And she goes, parks her car, gets out. She's hiked this trail before. But this time, she's kind of bored with the trail. She's on the trail, but she's like, okay, I've seen this before. But I heard that if I go down a little bit this way, that there's this beautiful waterfall that you can't see from the trail. So, so I want to go see this. So she gets off the trail, and she starts walking off of the hiking path. And as she gets down, she can't find the waterfall, and then she gets turned around. And she thinks she is walking in the direction of the trail and her car. But the truth is she was walking deeper and deeper into the jungle. Nightfall came. And she can't find her way out. And so she finally decides to hunker down and just find somewhere to sleep. And she goes to sleep for a while until daybreak. And she gets up and she starts walking again. And trusting her instincts that she's going the right way. But she's going deeper and deeper into the jungle. 17 days later, she was on top of a waterfall. She did find it. <laughs> it was about seven miles from where she had entered the trail. But 17 days later, surviving on berries and water from a stream, this is what Amanda Ellers looked like. That's a photograph of her two days before she got lost and a photograph from her after she was released from the hospital. She had lost over 20 pounds, and she was not a large woman anyway. You can tell she looked very healthy in the picture on the left-hand side. And she winds up malnourished and weak. Um, there was one point in the whole deal where um, there was a flash flood, and her shoes got swept away, she, so she walked bare feet. Her, her feet got all cut up on the lava rocks uh, that, uh, that is Hawaii. And when I look at her story, I, I think about us that we are, we are prone to wander. We are prone to drift off of the path that God has for us. And we are prone to go our own way and to think we know the way things ought to work and the way that we ought to be going when the truth is we're walking deeper and deeper into temptation and sometimes sin. So this morning, I really want us to dig in for just a few minutes and answer a question. And that is, how do we take this moment that we have experienced and turn it into movement in our lives? In a simpler form, how do I stay close to God? How do I do that? And we're going to look at a story in this passage of Scripture from Luke chapter 10 about a family of people that Jesus was actually quite close to. Let me give you a little background on them. They live in a village called Bethany. Bethany is about two miles from Jerusalem, so it's not a long walk for Jerusalem. Now, for some of you, like, you're like, that's eternity. I mean, I'd, I'd get in my car and go. But for people who lived and walked everywhere they went in the time of Jesus, two miles was not that far. Uh, and you could certainly walk it in you know, less than an hour. So if you were in Jerusalem, you could actually leave the city and walk out of the city to Bethany to like spend the night. And that's what Jesus did with his disciples a lot. Now we're told a couple of things about this family that are very, very interesting. 
First of all, in John's gospel, in John chapter 11, the Bible says that Mary, one of the sisters in this story, Mary was the one who came to Jesus and broke that expensive bottle of perfume and anointed his feet. She's the one that did that. And that probably began the relationship. And Jesus would go to Bethany and go to their house. Now later, a long time after this, they have a brother. His name is Lazarus. And he's going to get really sick. Uh, and Jesus is going to raise him from the dead. So this family is really entwined in the life of Jesus. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us in John 11 verse 5, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Jesus loved these folks. Now, does Jesus love everybody? Yes, Jesus loves everybody. But come on, we have relationships with people that are deeper. And Jesus had a deep relationship with this particular family. So he's in Jerusalem. He comes through Bethany, and he's going to stay at their house. And this is what unfolds that's going to help us with knowing how that we can get close and stay close to God. Look at verse 38. Now, as they were traveling along, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary and was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part which shall not be taken away from her. Now, before I plow into the text, I do want to talk for just a minute about Martha and Mary. Because I think that some of you have been in church for a long time. Martha is kind of given a bad rap in this story, okay? She, she kind of is. So let me just do a little comparison of these two sisters and help you understand them a little bit personality-wise. It's revealed to us actually in the text. Martha is an active person, right? She gets things done. Mary is a bit more passive. She's sitting at the feet of Jesus. Martha is a doer. Mary is probably more of someone who thought deeply about things. She's, she's really intent in listening to Jesus. Martha is very practical. She does things that are needed to get done, like somebody's got to cook a meal and somebody's got to clean up. And, and she's, she does practical things. Mary is more feeler. She operates in the realm of her emotions and, and feelings. And while they're very different, they're sisters. How many of you know that two kids raised in the same home can be very, very different, right? Now, I only have the one, so I'm not experienced as a parent in this regard. But I have a brother, and he had two daughters. And those two daughters, Heather and Jonna, are very, very different. Heather was the sweetest child that has ever graced planet Earth. I am just convinced that she was so sweet. Jonna was a terrorist looking for an organization to join. <laughs> Heather was very girly. She always was very girly, okay? And that's a great thing. Jonna was a little bit of a tomboy. And you know what? That's not a bad thing, okay? But they expressed themselves differently. When we would go for a visit, they would be so glad that we were there. Well, at least Heather would be. Uh, Heather would look at us and she would say, Uncle Bob, how long can you stay? After we'd been there a couple of hours, Jonna would say, when are you going home? <laughs> you know, they're just different, right? Now, they've both grown into adulthood and we love them both. And they are both great, great they were great kids back then, and they're great adults now, raising their uh, children to love Jesus, and, and I'm so proud of both of them. But they're just different. Raised in the same home, same genetics, right? Same mom and dad, but different. And Martha and Mary are different. But here's what I want you to know. 
Martha is active, Mary is passive. Martha is the doer, Mary is more of the thinker. Uh, they're, they're very different in that regard, but both of them love Jesus. Now, here's what I want you to hear me say. The world could not do without some Marthas. So we're not going to condemn Martha today, all right? Nothing gets done in your home unless somebody is the Martha, all right? Nothing gets done in church unless we've got some Marthas in here that are willing to do the work. I mean, you proved that this weekend with 180 Weekend. Nothing gets done in our world without a few Marthas, but, but we also need to learn from the Marys. And that's where we are today. So while, and by the way, while this is about two ladies, guys, there are a whole lot of Bible stories that are about men, so we're going to talk about the ladies today. But men, we can learn from this, and we need to learn from this, okay? So let's talk about this, and just let me kind of bring it in for a summary. First of all, let's talk about the enemies of a growing relationship with God. What is it that gets us off the path? What is it that, that gets us to a place where we're not, continuing a, a, mo a moment to become a movement in our lives. Four things. Number one, we are fragmented. We are fragmented. In the text, the Bible says that in verse 40, Martha was distracted with all her preparations. That word distracted means to be dragged, to be pulled in different directions. And, and Martha, she's She's thinking, I, I, got, I got to prepare this. I got to prepare the bread. Oh, but I got to prepare the, the lamb. Oh, I got, I got to prepare all of it. And I've got to do all these things. And she's just being dragged in different directions. And that's how our lives feel sometimes. I have a friend who grew up on a ranch. And uh, he would show calves in, a livestock, in livestock shows growing up. And some of you probably do that. And in order to do that, to take a calf to a livestock show... You have to train them because a calf is not naturally just going to walk around in a ring and present itself for the judges the way you want them to see the calf to, to win the show. So one day he's out with his calf. And by the way, don't think about a little 90, 100-pound calf. We're talking about a 300, 400-pound animal, okay? He's out and he's training this calf to, to walk in the ring. Now, you're supposed to hold the calf up really close to the halter to keep control of the calf, while you're, especially while you're training them and lead them around this ring. He's bored. So he takes the rope and he ties it around his waist, the lead rope, ties it around his waist. His dad says, son, you better untie that rope and hang on to that calf. And he says, no sooner had my dad said that, then that calf bolted, just ran. Now the rope is tied around his waist. And he's kind of like a guy standing on the dock waiting for the ski boat to take off, right? I mean, the rope is just unraveling. And all of a sudden he gets jerked and the calf drags him around the ring. And every time he tried to stand up, the calf would run again. and He'd drag him a little bit farther. That is the way our lives feel sometimes. That we are just being dragged in different directions. We are dragged by our overcommitted, marginless lives. So we are fragmented. We're frustrated. Mary, or rather Martha, is in the midst of all this preparation. And I can kind of see her. Like there's this cloud of flower dust from the kitchen, right? She is so frantic. And, and there's this noise of the clanging of pots and pans. You can make noise in a kitchen when you're not trying to make noise in a kitchen. But if you look over and you're doing all this work and you see your sister and she's sitting at the feet of Jesus and she smiles when Jesus says something funny and she it looks intense when Jesus says something profound and you're looking over there, do you know what makes a hardworking person matter than anything else? A person who's not working, right? I mean, come on, we've all been there before. And Martha looks over at Jesus and she says, Lord, do you not care? Anybody ever said those words before? Come on, you have. Lord, do you not care? Now, specifically, she says, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all of this stuff by myself. She is frustrated. And frustration, 
Frustration is low-grade anger. That's just really what it is. It's just a sense of I am angry about the way things are not working most of the time. We have all had something in our life that is not working. This past week, I, I had my, my truck, and we went out to start the truck, and the truck won't start. And I'm thinking, I'm hoping that it's the battery. Well, I tried to jump it off, and it still wouldn't start. But I decided to give it one more try and let it sit there for a while. You know how, guys, you know how you do that? And, and, and I let it sit there for a while. And, and eventually, I'm just getting frustrated because it's not working. Well, eventually, I got it started, but it was the battery. We bought a new battery. But we get frustrated when things don't work. At least they don't work the way we think they ought to work. And sometimes in our frustration over the way we think life ought to be working, we wander away from the Lord. You know, the plans that you had don't work out. Or the way that you think things ought to be going in your life, the way you think things ought to be going on your team, the way you think things ought to be going in your academic pursuits, the way you think things ought to be going in your career are not the way they're working out. And we grow frustrated and angry about that. And we look at the Lord and say, Lord, you don't care about me. You don't care. We've all been in that boat. We are fragmented. We are frustrated. We are frightened. Jesus looks at Martha and he says, Martha, Martha. He says her name twice. By the way, I believe that Scripture is the perfect, preserved record of things that Jesus said. Now, we don't have everything that Jesus said, but when we have something Jesus said, it's perfectly preserved. When someone says your name twice, there's a meaning there. If someone says your name once, they're trying to communicate, I want your attention. But if they say your name twice, it is a sign of affection. If someone says, Bob, you just want my attention. But if someone goes, Bob, Bob, it's a word of care. So it, it's actually a response to her, do you not care? But he says to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried. The word for worry here is a really interesting word. And it is deeply rooted in our fears. Worry, one worry won't distract you very much. But the truth is our worries come at us so many times. Like they come in all different directions. You don't get one worry at a time. Like if I had one thing at a time to deal with, I can handle that. But, but I got like 15 things coming at me. I've got things coming at me family-wise. I got things coming at me financial-wise. I got things coming at me from the church. I got things coming at me with people I care about. You just got all this stuff just coming at you. And we become worried, and worry is rooted in fear. When I was a kid, one of my great friends growing up, his name was Phil Patterson. Phil's dad had a job that took him to Venezuela. Now, this was the 1970s. And uh, Venezuela had not yet been turned into the socialist paradise that it is today where you can't even buy bread on a, on a street. It was actually a very wealthy country. It was a, a country that boasted a, a gross domestic product almost the equal to the United States. I mean, it was, it was a great place to live. So he goes down there. And when he came back two years later, he brought my brother and I a little souvenir. And the souvenir was a little stuffed piranha which is kind of an interesting gift for somebody, right? But it was a stuffed piranha. And I looked at that little piranha, and I thought, how in the world would anybody be afraid of that? Like, it's one little fish. It's, they're not big at all. Now, they do have very sharp teeth. But I learned this about piranha. And what I learned is that one piranha really can't harm you very much. Oh, it could bite you. It could hurt you. It could cut you. But it, it can't kill you. But piranha never attack with one fish. Piranha attack in schools of hundreds of fish. You don't get bitten by one piranha. Well, you do by the first one. But eventually, the other 999 are coming, okay? And so what's ha what happens is that you are overwhelmed by all the bites. And that's the way worry works. It's seldom, I mean, it's seldom one thing at a time we get to worry about. It's a hundred things that just press into our lives. And our worries choke out the life God has for us. Jesus told a story about, uh, about seed, about a sower sowing seed. And this is what he said in Luke 8, 14. The seed which fell among the thorns, 
These are the ones who have heard, and as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity. Worry chokes the life out of us. And finally, we are frantic. The word there is bothered. He says, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things. This is the only time in the New Testament that word is used, and it is used in secular Greek for a stormy sea. The waves are rolling, the wind is howling, the lightning is crashing, uh, the, the rain is pouring, and, and you just don't have no direction in which to go, and you're just tossed and turned, and, and you can't get your bearings. And when all those sort of things happen, we're fragmented, we're frustrated, we're frightened, and we're frantic. When those things happen, we wander away from God. It happens to all of us. We just drift. So how do you combat that? What are the essentials for a growing relationship with God? How do we take this moment and turn it into a movement? Three things. Number one, take time to be with the Lord. The Bible says that Mary was seated at the Lord's feet and listening to his word. Those last few words, listening to his words. Now, she got the privilege to actually hear Jesus speak. I've often thought, how cool would that have been? Now, I don't get that direct privilege, but I can hear him speak, and all I have to do is pick this up. Students, adults, if you want to take the moment and allow it to turn into a movement in your life, You must constantly, consistently be feeding your life on the Word of God. I just, we say it over and over, but you don't do it. So we got to keep saying it again. I don't know how many people come to me with problems and issues in their lives, and I say, Tell me about your devotional life. Tell me about your life with God. Well, I've been busy. Well, I got stuff going on. You've got to come to a place in your life where you realize, I am too busy not to read the Bible. I am too busy not to pray. I'm not too busy to pray. I'm too busy not to pray. I must take time to be with the Lord. Practically, I'm going to tell you, at my house, I have to do it before anybody else gets up or it doesn't get done. That is just how it works at my house. I don't know how it's going to work at your house, but I'm going to tell you, you need a time. You need a place And you need a plan. You need a time. You say, okay, this is when I'm going to do it. By the way, if you're just starting out, don't have this ambitious, I'm going to spend two hours with the Lord this morning. No, no, no. Let's try 15 minutes, okay? Let's try that. Maybe 10. Get a plan. You can go on, uh, you know, version and find all kind of reading plans, devotional plans. Just get one, please. Find one. Anyone is better than no one. And then have a place. Let me tell you about why place is important. You can isolate yourself from distractions. You need a time, you need a plan, you need a place. Number two, determine what is really most important. Determine what is really most important. We spend so many resources, we spend so much time, we we exert so much energy on stuff that it's just not going to matter. It's not going to matter 10,000 years from now for sure. But some of the stuff we spend so much time on is not going to matter next week. It's not going to matter tomorrow. We spend so much time on things that don't matter and so little time on things that are eternal, like our soul, like the development of our soul. Jesus says to Mary, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. You've got to determine what is really most important. And three, choose to act on what is most important. It's not enough to know. It's not enough to say, okay, I I know this is what I ought to do. Eventually, you just got to do something, okay? You actually have to do it. And that that is where your will comes in. You have a will. You have decisions. And you can choose to do this. And eventually you have to. It has to be between you and Jesus. Why should you spend time 
with Jesus. Why should you listen to this message? Well, here's the point of the whole message. If I could boil down this message to one single simple point, here it is. If you spend time at the feet of Jesus, you'll be able to stand when trials come. If you will spend time at Jesus' feet, you will be able to stand when difficult times come. Let's pray together. Maybe in this moment, some of you need to make a commitment to the Lord and to simply say, Lord, I have, I have put other things in front of my time with you. I have put my own goals, my own pursuits. I have put my own responsibilities. And those are important, but I've put them in front of you. Sometimes I've let good things Take the time away from the best thing. And today, Lord, I'm asking you to give me the strength and to strengthen my will that I will act on what I know to do today. There are others of you in this room that maybe you're frustrated in your life with God because you've come to church, you've been religious, but you've never truly trusted Christ. And I'm just going to tell you this. The power to do this is not rooted in you or even in your will. It's rooted in the Holy Spirit that comes to indwell you the moment you trust Jesus as your Savior. And what you, you need is not more religion and more routine. I don't, I don't want anybody to leave here believing that. What you need is Jesus first. And so maybe this morning you need to trust Christ. Whatever the need of your heart, we're going to sing a song in just a few minutes. We're going to stand up after I pray. There are going to be some pastors here at the front. If you need to trust Jesus, if you need to pray with someone about this, if by moving to the front to pray and to make a commitment to the Lord that you're going to put him first in your life, then, then you do that. If you just need to come pray by yourself, that's okay. But if you need a pastor, we'll be here. Father, we give you this moment, and we want so much more than a moment. Would you please take this moment and turn it into a movement in our hearts, in our church, and in our world. In Jesus' name, amen.